I want to do a series um, on the podcast looking at the ideas and the sort of Christian apologetics of Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas believed by many to be uh, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, um, of the Christian thinkers. And But before I do that, I thought I would say a little word about why we read and think about today uh, medieval philosophy. Well, the reason is that the medievals took very seriously the questions that many of us today, at least those of us who are believers, uh, our questions are their questions. And in a secular age where we find not only very little discussion of these important questions, we often find instead the most shallow regurgitations of arguments that the medievals refuted centuries ago. And we see that the medievals are approaching these questions with a depth and a sophistication, a seriousness of purpose that is unmatched in almost anything you see today. I've been doing debates for several years with these new atheists, and they are not in the same league. Uh, well, they're on the same league as me, but they're on the same league as uh, Anselm or Augustine or Aquinas by a mile. Now, I thought I would sort of demonstrate this a little bit because I was looking at a book by Victor Stenger. Victor Stenger is actually a physicist, but he's uh, one of these guys who rails against God. His book is called The Failed Hypothesis. So he's pretending here that God's a hypothesis. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conduct some experiments to investigate this hypothesis. Oh, it's a failed hypothesis. But in it, he, he, you have not just scientific arguments, but a lot of psychobabble. And then, of course, what I would call the one of his so-called knockdown drag out arguments uh, uh, that he thinks is a real winner is a question that he poses. Can God make a stone so heavy that even he can't lift it? Now, uh, this is not original with, with Victor Stenger. You see it. If you Google the problem, you'll see that it's, it's out there. And uh, atheists think that it's kind of a, a very clever uh, way to knock out uh, an important, well, not necessarily the existence of God, but the idea of the omnipotence of God. Uh, and uh, the question is crafted in such a way that sort of no matter how you answer it, it seems like there's something that God can't do. So here's the question. Can God make a stone so heavy that he, even he can't lift it? So let's say that God can't lift the stone. In that case... God's not omnipotent. He can't lift that stone. But let's say that God can lift every stone. If God can lift every stone, then God cannot create a stone that he can't lift. And therefore, he's not omnipotent on that grounds because there's something that God can't do. So either way, it appears God's omnipotence is undermined. Now, the medievals... Um, took a look at not this exact problem, but both Anselm and Aquinas have something to say about the meaning of God's omnipotence. And when we look at that, it immediately solves this problem. So this is really the benefit of medieval thought is they think a lot about what does it mean to say that God is omnipotent. Now, before Anselm and before Aquinas, uh, the church father Jerome um, made the following claim that was subsequently debated for a couple of hundred years in medieval thought. It was this, is does God have the power? If God is omnipotent, can he take a married woman who has had children and make her into a virgin? And Jerome answered this question, no. Jerome's reasoning was that God cannot do things that are contradictory or ridiculous. That is not what omnipotence means. Now, there were some medievals who held the opposite. Well, well, yes, he's God. He really can do anything. Uh, he, can in, he can rewrite the past. He can, he can make two plus two equal five. He is, after all, God. And so this issue was went back and forth. But what came out of it was a kind of clear definition of omnipotence, which I think is very helpful. And that is, if you think about omnipotence, and think about the word om omnipotence, omni which means surpassingly great, and potence, so potency, which means power. So omnipotence doesn't mean uh, that you can do, quote, anything. Omnipotence means you have unlimited power. 
And if you think about it that way, um, and, and now we're, we're moving into the, into the work of Aquinas, uh, Aquinas' view is that God can do anything that is that God wants to do. Anything that is possible to do, God can do. Why? Because God has the unlimited power to do that. But self-contradictory things, says Aquinas, are not possible. And so unlimited power doesn't enable you to do what is in fact not possible to do. So what, what do we draw from this? We draw from this a couple of clear conclusions. One, there is no stone so heavy that God can't create it. And there's no stone so heavy that God can't lift it. And since there's no stone so heavy that God can't either make it or lift it, when you ask the question, can God create a stone so heavy that he can lift? The answer is obviously, no, he can't. Why? Because he can lift every possible stone. So the fact that God cannot create a stone so heavy that he can't lift it is not a problem for God's omnipotence. It is the result of his omnipotence. It's because God is omnipotent that he can't make a stone that he can't lift because he can lift every possible stone. So what we see here is, um, again, the smart alecky modern atheists who come up with a verbal conundrum that upon examination kind of falls apart. It falls apart because it is not, in fact, a refutation of God's omnipotence. It's a demand that God do the logically impossible. But since it is God himself who made the rules of logic, since it is God himself who decided these are the laws by which the universe is going to operate, then God himself functions in the universe within and according to the laws that he himself made.